Alrighty, now that this is kneaded up, you've got the nice spiral going on, now what we're going to do is we're going to start making it into a slab. Uh, because that's going to be a fairly quick, easy construction for you if you feel that you want to coil this. I will be showing you the use of coils later. It's going to be more for reinforcing joints than anything. But I know and I understand some of you like coils even better. So if you want to do more coils and less slab versus more slab and less coils, show me. Let me know. Okay, so after we have this kneaded, we're going to start throwing this into a slab. It's easier to throw into a slab than to take a rolling pin or take our hands and pound this into a flat slab from a huge chunk like this. Throwing to start the slab is using our downward force and motion to kind of stretch this clay out so that it becomes a flat slab like sugar cookie dough. And then we'll finish rolling it the rest of the way. So when I throw a slab, I'm not just slamming this down. I'm kind of slamming this down and pulling it back toward myself and that helps the surface of this stretch the clay into a nice slab that we have. And I rotate the slab as I go. And you see how nice and long and skinny it is? If I want it fatter, then I start throwing in the other direction. I'm going to use a wooden dowel for this because it's a little bit longer than my rolling pin. Again, if you don't have something like this, even a broom handle might work. If you can take the end of the broom off or just have the head of the broom off to the side, uh, anything that's round and cylindrical is going to work. Now when I tend to roll this, I do flip it. And if you guys remember, there might be air bubbles. I'm not perfect, I see air bubbles. So I'm going to take my handy dandy paper clip and I'm going to pop them because you guys will be able to have these fired at a later date and have them glazed and all that good fun stuff. For right now, we're just doing the bare bones of this project, meaning the construction of it, because we got to let it dry before we can fire it at school anyway. So if you see air bubbles, poke one or two holes and then squeegee the air out of them. And then I just like to give it another roll with the rolling pin, get it down. And then I carefully pick this up. It's not sticking because it's on bare wood. And I try and look at the other side here. Roll it out, see what we got. Okay, so junior high, we have a nice slab rolled out. I think I have the air bubbles popped. If not, and they come back, I'll pop them again. So now, because I am going to be playing with, if you can see it, this idea, I'm going to be using an ice cream pail as my stencil for this. Remember guys, if you are doing something like a wrapped piece, you could use a piece of paper, a piece of paper towel, and lightly lay this on here, and then take your butter knife, and you could cut this out this way. But again, for mine, I am doing the notched bowl, so I need something round. So I found an ice cream pail, unicorns and Easter, pretty cool. And when I cut this out, I am going to hug one of the sides of the slab because I'm going to be using some of this remaining slab to build other things on top of this bowl. Remember, we're doing a sculpture. So it's not just a bowl and it's done. I want you to build on it. I want you to carve into it. I want you to add things to it. That's called additive and subtractive sculpture. Additive is when you add pieces. Subtractive is when you cut them or carve them away. You're also creating something called sculpture in the round. And that means that this whole thing is going to be designed, meaning all around on all sides. So, which, hence the name, sculpture in the round. I have my circle cut. Before the rest of this clay dries out, I'm going to ball it up and I'm going to throw it back in my plastic bag. I had a conference with myself and I'm like, well, you know what, I'll still do the bowl, but instead of notching it, I'm going to be creating lap joints from slits that I cut in the walls of the bowl. What I did is I found myself a ruler. If you've got a ruler, great. If not, even the dowel that you may have used, that could be a great straight edge just to draw some lines. But the ruler helps with measuring if you want to do similar to what I am doing in the demo here. 
what I had to do was find where the center of the circle was. So my circle that I cut is about eight and a half to nine inches long. It's not perfect because it's clay and when I flip it, it moves. And I have not used any water to this point, so that cup I have not touched at all. You don't want to continuously use water because that's going to turn this into slip. And that's what this is for. We don't need to make more. So when I am doing this, I am just laying the ruler on my circle and kind of splitting the difference, shoving the ruler around a little bit if I have to, and guesstimating where about center of this circle is, which is about right here. So I'm using a really dull, old, cruddy pencil to put that mark down. Then what I did from the center is I lined up in four different directions, so kind of like a compass, north, south, east, and west. And they are directly across from each other, just like you're cutting a pizza. And what I wanted to do was just draw some lines that are the same length coming in from each edge of the circle. This is again if you want to try this method. If not, there are a ton of other methods that you can play with. I want you to play. I want you to experiment. So what I did on this version is I went an inch and a half out from the center and I drew a line to the edge of my circle. That's what I'm going to do for the rest of these right now. Okay, we got something like that. Next step, take your butter knife, cut on your lines. Take your time, keep them straight. So now we have kind of a weird four leaf clover shape going on. Okay, whatever you do, I would not pick this up yet just because it's gonna wanna tear right where you started cutting. So now the next step is I am actually going to take and form the bowl. So, gonna change angles. Okay, change angles, here we go. Okay, so when I am forming this bowl, I am going to be creating what's called a lap joint. And a lap joint is exactly that, when one part of your clay overlaps the other part, kind of like that. All righty, junior high, I had to take a break for a minute and mush my slip because it wasn't quite the consistency I needed. So again, you're not using chunks, you're using mud. So if you have to go and take a break and smush your slip, you go ahead and do that. So now we are actually going to start slipping and scoring and creating these lap joints. So I'm gonna overlap these joints about an inch and a half all the way around. Now I might wanna play with this little end later, so I may not score that area. I might just score a column on the outside of one slab and the inside of the other slab, and then stick that together for now. And then I'll show you what we can do from there. But I'm just gonna work on this for a bit. Alrighty, speaking of joinery, junior high, I wanted to show you a couple of other examples yeah, that you can do besides the lap joinery that I'm showing you. So as a refresher, making sure we're focused here, a lap joint is when you take two pieces of clay and when you slip and score them together, they overlap each other. That's why it's called a lap joint. So it doesn't matter if it's a little bit thinner than this or thicker. Remember when you're doing anything with clay, uh, rule of thumb is your clay shouldn't be any thicker than your thumb. We don't want things blowing up in the kiln. So that's a lap joint when it overlaps each other. A butt joint is exactly that. You have two pieces of clay and they butt up next to each other. Whether it's a 90 degree angle or if you start cutting on certain angles, but then we get into miter joints, which is the next thing I'm going to talk about. When you're butting things up to one another, you're usually scoring one edge of your clay and then scoring the face of the other chunk of clay so that it butts up, whether it's next to or on top of. If this was a vessel that I was creating, it's structurally more sound to have the bottom stay on the bottom and the top, or the wall I should say, of the piece go on top the bottom. This is a lot weaker than this. So if you're constructing something using butt joints, you want the walls of your piece to be on top of your foundation, on top of your base plate, your base piece of your functional sculpture. Okay, so that's a butt joint. For a miter joint, it starts off looking like a butt joint. Everything is pretty squared off. But then I'm going to take my, in this case, butter knife, because we're using what we got, and I'm cutting, in this case, on a 45 degree angle or pretty close. So now I have something that looks like that. I'm going to cut the same on 
the other side. Just a little nice 45. So this is used a lot for woodworking, whether it's cabinetry, making picture frames, making stretchers for paintings, anything like that. My clay's a little gummy, so it ripped a little bit. That's okay. But now for a miter joint, because because we cut things on an angle, when we slip and score them together, they will make, in this case, a 90 degree angle. But again, depending on how many sides your vessel is, if you've got a five or a six or an eight sided piece, your miters might not be 45 degrees. They may be more or they may be less. They might be obtuse or they might be acute. So there's a little math term for you. Depends on your design. But where we cut for the miter, that's where we would slip and score and that's where we would attach. Now, if we're slipping and scoring these together and it's kind of a weak joint, then we would have to reinforce the joint. Focus, focus. Again, when you're creating something like a butt joint, you're usually scoring. That's the wrong finger to use. 